Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Heritage Foundation's president, Kay Coles James. Good morning. Welcome. It is still morning, isn't it? By a few. We're delighted to uh, host this event here at the Heritage Foundation today where we explore how to advance women's economic empowerment here at home and indeed across the globe. And it is my pleasure to be joined today by Manisha Singh, the Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs. The Assistant Secretary is responsible for advancing prosperity in America as well as entrepreneurship and innovation worldwide by working in countries around the world to help advance individuals and economies, the Bureau creates new opportunities and new markets for U.S. companies and their employees. We know that increasing the number of people participating in the global economy promotes stronger and healthier national economies. It also lifts people out of poverty and leads to more stable societies. And all of that leads to great trading partners for America and the world. While we clearly see the benefits of having more people involved in the global economy in many parts of the world, a huge part of the population, specifically women, haven't had access to economic opportunities. They've often been left out of the equation. The result isn't just an inherent unfairness, but often poverty for themselves and for their families. That's why our Assistant Secretary and her team are working to ensure that women around the globe have access to new economic opportunities, and then they connect them with American businesswomen and entrepreneurs. Giving women equal access to opportunities, in fact, giving everyone equal access, is an issue that's near and dear to my heart. As an African-American woman who grew up poor in the segregated South, I know from experience what it's like to not have the same rights and opportunities as the people around you. I also know what it was like when those rights were finally recognized and when America decided to live up to its creed and work to right some of our terrible wrongs from the past. The opportunities eventually began to flow, and I was eager to take advantage of them. I got a great education, I worked hard, and obviously I flourished. Look where I am today. Yay! <laughs> you know, I really look back on my life with a great deal of pride. I've had the privilege of serving three presidents, you know, one could not have guessed that I would have had the opportunity to dine with kings and princes and prime ministers. And today I serve as the president of the number one ranked think tank in the world for its impact on public policy. And every day I get to help 330 million Americans and people all around the world become more free and more prosperous. I'm also proud of the fact that a lot of Heritage's leadership is indeed female. The chairman of our board of trustees, three of our vice presidents, several of our policy center directors are very 
accomplished women. At Heritage, we're dedicated to promoting the empowerment of every human being, especially through the advancement of economic freedom. Our decades of research show that the world's wealthiest nations have achieved peace and prosperity by embracing one proven formula. That formula is democratic government with limited power, free people, free markets, the rule of law, and private property rights. These elements all create economic freedom, the opportunity to advance oneself and one's family as far as your ambition, your abilities, and your very dreams will take you. The higher a nation's level of economic freedom, the better outcomes we see in the citizens' health and their well-being, their education attainment, the cleanliness of their environment, and indeed their very standard of living. By giving more women access to that freedom, we can promote the stronger and healthier national economies, lift more families out of poverty, and create more stable and peaceful societies and fantastic trading partners. It's truly a win-win for everyone. And that's why I'm so excited to have my friend, the Assistant Secretary, with us today. As head of the State Department's Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs, she leads a team of over 200 employees and over 1,500 economic officers posted in embassies around the world, and she's the first woman appointed to that role. She also served under George W. Bush, where she was responsible for developing and promoting international trade policy. In the private sector, she practiced international financial and trade law. She has a lot of terrific insights to share with us today. So please join me in a warm Heritage Family welcome to Assistant Secretary of State Manisha Singh. You know, w w we got this. We even we shake hands and hug here. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here Thank today. Thank you, Kay. Thank you so much. Well, I'm going to say to Kay um, that I'm so honored and humbled to receive an introduction from someone like her who embodies the definition of great leadership. The Heritage Foundation is incredibly lucky to have her at its helm. She's been a champion of women leaders and entrepreneurs and an inspiration not just to women, but to everyone. I also want to thank the great staff at Heritage, especially Anna Quintana and Olivia Enos, who have facilitated this event today. Heritage has always promoted economic freedom around the world, recognizing that such freedom leads to better opportunities and more stable societies overall. I'm an avid consumer of the Index of Economic Freedom, which defines economic freedom as the fundamental right of every human to control his or her own labor and property. At the State Department, economic freedom, prosperity, and security for American workers and companies are central to our mission. As Kay mentioned, I lead a team of over 200 people at the State Department's Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs here in Washington, with almost 2,000 economic officers posted at our embassies and consulates around the world. Our central mission has been further defined and strengthened by President Trump in the National Security Strategy, which indicates that economic security is national security. Being a secure nation includes having a strong domestic economy, being able to provide the essentials for our own defense, and having an economy and trade agreements that work for everyone. The NSS further states that societies which empower women to participate fully in civic and economic life are more prosperous and more peaceful. The result is a strong, secure American economy where women play a vital role in its success. This is also my personal vision for the Economic Bureau and our contribution to the country. 
I'm delighted to be here during Women's History Month to share my thoughts with you on this very important topic. Economic success for women is about more than having a seat in the boardroom or running our own companies. It's ultimately about controlling our own fates, controlling our own futures. It's about moving societies forward for everyone's benefit. And you don't have, just have to take my word for it. Statistics have shown that empowering women in the labor force is simply smart economic policy. The American economy is experiencing its longest economic expansion on record due to the Trump administration's pro-growth policies. We have historic low unemployment, sustained GDP growth with a strong stock market that will rebound. The jobs report in February exceeded expectations and the economy added 273,000 jobs. The number of women in the workforce is high and women entrepreneurs are the fastest growing demographic in our prosperity narrative. We need to continue this momentum and improve the platforms, the access to resources, and remove the barriers that women entrepreneurs may face. This idea has the full support of the administration in the Women's Global Development and Prosperity, or WGDP, initiative, uh, which many of you may know about. Exactly as the name implies, when women participate fully in the economy, the GDPs of nations rise. President Trump signed an executive order establishing the WGDP last year. It's being implemented under the leadership of senior advisor Ivanka Trump. Last month, she and Secretary Pompeo hosted the one-year anniversary of the WGDP with representatives from throughout the U.S. government at the State Department. The initiative aims to reach 50 million women by 2025 and will focus on three pillars. Those pillars are women prospering in the workforce, women succeeding as entrepreneurs, and women enabled in the economy. It's the very first whole of government approach to advancing women's economic empowerment. Turning to the statistics I mentioned earlier, the White House Council of Economic Advisors has determined that fully eliminating restrictions on women's economic participation could increase annual glo global GDP by $7.7 .7 trillion, or 8.3%. That's quite a compelling case for the full economic involvement of over, the world, of, of, of over half the world's population. To reach these numbers, we can mobilize platforms and resources to enable women to start their own companies and enterprises. In my bureau, we determine to use our best skills and assets including partnering with the private sector to create the ultimate power tool. And by power, I mean providing opportunities for women's economic rise. How did power originate? Well, as I discussed earlier, a strong economy, including full participation by women, is central to President Trump's national security strategy. And let me also share my personal story. When I was nominated to head the Economic Bureau, I did research on the position. I looked at my list of predecessors, going back to the 1940s when the Bureau was created. I realized that I was not like the others. As Kay mentioned, I was the first woman nominated and eventually confirmed by the Senate for this role. I committed then to make it a priority to ensure that women should have every opportunity to be pillars of our economy. In my subsequent travels, I met with women business owners all over the world and here at home in the US. And I, keep, I kept hearing similar thoughts. Some women wanted to start their own businesses. Others had enterprises which they wanted to grow and scale. As the State Department's economic arm, thought, how could we help? Well, 
we could create actionable solutions to the challenges that women entrepreneurs face when trying to access global markets. What does this mean? Well, let me explain. Our first tier of the Power Initiative was to solicit proposals from our embassies and consulates around the world. We ask that these proposals identify specific methods or tools to better assist American women entrepreneurs access the market in their host country and vice versa. The two required criteria are a U.S. nexus and a concrete deliverable result. The idea was to create a network to provide resources and identify barriers through partnerships with the private sector, utilizing our missions abroad as the conveners. And we have modest funding that we grant to the top proposals. I thought that we'd get a few proposals here and there, but my staff and I have combed through dozens on just our first solicitation. We have drawn on the full breadth of our diplomatic network, of our diplomatic network private sector partnerships, and existing U.S. government programs. These connections facilitate business development and investment among women entrepreneurs, leading to better export opportunities, better funding, and very importantly, the ability to hire more workers. We have also included women's economic empowerment as a central component in at least six of our annual bilateral economic dialogues with other countries, emphasizing its centrality to our mission. Like the WGDP, we are celebrating one year of power. Last spring, at our launch, we invited some of our private sector friends who share our deep commitment to provide their input and discuss ways in which our embassies could partner with them on power proposals. And last week, we again convened private sector stakeholders to discuss our progress and build new partnerships. I think some of you might have been there. Currently, we have power projects in 14 countries with more to come soon. Let me share a few of them with you. In September of last year, U.S. Embassy Jakarta partnered with MasterCard to showcase U.S. private sector solutions in the fintech space at the first Indonesian International FinTech Festival. An outcome of this was the establishment of a working group for women in FinTech. This group will promote cross-border access to resources for women entrepreneurs and strengthen U.S.-Indonesian business ties. Our stakeholders are expanding potential partnerships in the region to help women entrepreneurs build professional networks, and access more financing opportunities. Another winning project was submitted by our U.S. Embassy in Azerbaijan. For this project, PricewaterhouseCoopers in Baku supported a 10-week business development training program for women, small, and medium-sized enterprises. They were matched with representatives from the U.S. private sector and with the American Chamber of Commerce to explore business relationships with American women-led SMEs. Here in the Western Hemisphere, a great project was submitted by our U.S. consulate in Tijuana. Along with an organization called Mujer PYME, they organized a two-week business development boot camp to help women entrepreneurs in the San Diego and Tijuana regions develop and scale their businesses within the formal economy leading to greater bilateral trade. A key area that we highlighted was navigation of U.S.-Mexico trade laws, customs, and tax codes to take advantage of the new U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement, USMCA as it's commonly known. From the 80 applicants, 30 were selected to participate in business skills training workshops. The top 15 business plans were invited to a pitch competition for potential funding from private sector sources. As a follow-up to this workshop, I led a roundtable in Southern California, bringing together beneficiaries of the Power Project 
with the Orange County Chapter of the National Association of Women Business Owners to identify synergies in support of women-led business activities across the border. We received our second round of proposals and we're very excited to select amongst the best of them. They include topics such as access to investors and fund managers, facilitating e-commerce, better utilization of trade agreements, and creating fair trade markets. Our next tier under development is a domestic outreach strategy, which will better facilitate the U.S. Nexus part of our initiative. We'll have a power toolkit designed to inform the American private sector on how to utilize their specific expertise in our program and how to partner with our embassies on project proposals. It will also provide a deeper blueprint for our diplomats overseas to explore connections with you on their power proposals, fulfilling the U.S. nexus portion of the criteria. One of my favorite power-inspired stories involves organic efforts by our econ team to better utilize women-owned businesses. And this will really show you how central it is to our mission at the State Department. At one of our embassies in South America, our economic officers noticed that very few of the bidders on our embassy contracts were from women-owned companies. After some thought, they developed a simple training for women-owned businesses to provide them with information on procurement opportunities with the embassy. Within one year after this simple information exercise, the amount of women-owned business contracts with the embassy went from $74,000 in 2016 to over $440,000 in 2017. Significantly, this effort benefited the American taxpayer. It resulted in more cost-effective options from which the embassy could choose. By engaging women-owned businesses, the embassy increased competition in the market, which in turn lowered costs for U.S. taxpayers. Free markets and women entrepreneurs. What a phenomenal combination. In conclusion, I'd like to say that when we talk about the economic empowerment of women, by now, we know that it's synonymous with contributions to the world economy at large, as Kay mentioned and defined very accurately. This has been determined by extensive studies in both the public and private sector. It's also why we chose to ensure that private sector partners are an integral part of the power initiative. We wanna hear from every part of the community on how to make it more effective how we can better shape it to achieve the very important goals that we've outlined. I want to thank my amazing staff, especially Dr. Bita Ade, who is a brilliant engineer. She's standing in the back there and therefore assembled power for us. And Christine Bucci, who provided the rock solid support. There's Christine. And I want to thank you for coming today. I know it's a challenging period to be out in groups of people and so I know that I'm looking at a group of fearless leaders. So thank you again for coming. When it comes to our remarkable women entrepreneurs, our economy, and our future, I want to leave you with President Trump's words from his State of the Union earlier this year. This nation is our canvas, and this country is our masterpiece. We look at tomorrow and see unlimited frontiers just waiting to be explored. Our brightest discoveries are not yet known. Our most thrilling stories are not yet told. Our grandest journeys are not yet made. With that, I invite you to come with us on our journey. Thank you again for being here today, and thank you to Heritage.
Thank you so much, Assistant Secretary, for your really wonderful remarks. I think it was enlightening to all of us here to be able to hear more about the Power Initiative. And I know I personally was especially inspired to hear the stories um, and to hear the initiatives that you guys are engaging in, especially the FinTech Initiative with Jakarta. That sounds really, really fascinating. Um, so we do want to open it up to discussion. I think we're going to take two or three questions at a time, but I'm going to take moderator's privilege and start with one. It'll give you guys a little bit of time to think through the questions. Um, but, you know, we heard about a lot of different initiatives that you guys have already undertaken. If you were to highlight just one thing that the U.S. government is doing, or maybe that the U.S. government can do in the future, what would it be? And what single thing would best help uh, to improve women's economic empowerment? That's, that's a great question. And I think we thought about that in the Power Initiative. There are a lot of women's networking forums and professional development associations, and I think those are great and very valuable. One of the things that I wanted to emphasize was the concrete deliverable result. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned with the Women's FinTech Initiative, you know, we want women who have great ideas in the technology space, in the finance space, to be able to talk to other women, but I'd also like to find a way to get them the financing and the funding they need to actually scale their mm -hmm. enterprises. You know, I heard a statistic that indicated that about 3% of venture funding goes to women-owned enterprises. And I thought, 3%? How can that be possible? I know women in the technology space who have these great ideas. And then I spoke with um, venture capitalists and funding sources who said, we would love to fund women-owned enterprises. Um, however, when we hold pitch competitions, a lot of times we don't get women entrepreneurs there. So my thought, you know, going forward, your question about the future is let's make that link. You know, we as government, we're not, we're not business, we're not enterprise. Government and business are separate. But I do think government can play a role where we provide these platforms. For, our, for instance, our embassies overseas have such convening power. Just even hosting these events or bringing people together at the embassy can make such a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that your answer included both the role of government, but also the role of individuals, citizens, women, um, and civil society and, and the business community. So with that, I'd love to open it up for questions. Um, please identify your affiliation and please ask a question, no long dissertations. Um, so we'll, we'll go ahead and start in the back. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Colton Moore here with the uh, Heritage Foundation. What relationship do you have with the Export-Import Bank of the United States? And uh, President Trump appointed a female head for that for the first time as well. And from what I understand, she has the initiative to work with women businesses throughout the world. So do you have any particular relationship with expanding that role? Yes, thank you. I'm Rob Colarina. I'm with an equity investment group based here in the States. Um, you know, that was an interesting um, draw you have on, on the different embassies um, around, the, around the world. Could you speak a little bit about um, what your observations were, were certain countries having actually more women-led um, or women-owned businesses? Um, could you speak on to any trends as to where it's growing or where you, there were pleasant surprises for that type of uh, frequency? Questions? We can start with those two. So that's a great question on Exim Bank, and, and Kim is wonderful. I'm so glad that Exim has a great leader who happens to be a woman as well. Um, and the answer to that is, you know, Exim is of course a, a separate entity, but at the State Department, the Economic Bureau is the arm that coordinates um, Exim Bank, and you may know the may know the new Development Finance Corporation, which is the supersized OPEC. So Development Finance Agencies, Exim, you know, we do coordinate with them on our interagency approach. So whatever support she needs, you know, whatever backing she needs from our embassies around the world, we make sure that the Exim Bank gets it. Um, you know, and we advise on their programs. We all make sure that we're in sync, that we're not duplicating efforts, that we're providing our indiv individual competencies to the, the bigger picture. So Kim and I do, do talk frequently. Um, 
And on your question about women business uh, trends around the world, you know, one of the things that I've seen is the interest. You know, as I mentioned, whether I had conversations in South America, um, in Europe, in the Middle East, in Southeast Asia, the questions from the women that I received were very much the same. You know, I spoke to a group of women entrepreneurs in Tel Aviv, and they said, you know, we've had some decent luck here in the Israeli market. How can we export to the United States? Similarly, I've had many conversations with the National Association of Women Business Owners here in the U.S., which is an American uh, group, and they said the same thing to me. You know, we've done well in our region and in our state, but how can we export to Europe? And that's where I thought that the State Department could play a role. So I think the common theme I heard everywhere was this interest in growing and scaling. Um, you know, and governments around the world have an interest in helping as well. Most of my government counterparts that I've spoken with, again, regardless of region, whether it's in Europe or in Asia, everyone wants to benefit their economy. Even if you don't believe in, you know, I, I, I find it unfortunate that people wouldn't believe in fairness and equality, but to the extent that people are just looking at the bottom line of economic growth, that's where women entrepreneurs are contributing. You know, global GDPs are rising because women are fully participating. That's great. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Shannon Kendrick, I, I work at the Peace Corps, and uh, we do a lot with WGDP. This is a fun question. We see a lot of projects that have been developed, but in all of your exposure to seeing it from a higher level throughout the entire world, what are some of the most impressive uh, businesses or businesses that are being developed or underway from this initiative? I think that's a, a, a great question. And I'll, I'll give sort of a general answer without focusing on you know, any specific case. Um, some of the things that I like to see are in the technology space. Because, you know, a lot of people say, well, why do women or, or girls need to be involved in STEM? You know, of course, the WGDP, there's an education component. We really would like to see young women start at an earlier age on science, technology, engineering, and math. And one of the reasons I think that's so important is because technology is no longer an industry. It's a matter of the technology in your industry, whatever that may be. You know, whether it's it's healthcare or retail, every industry, technology is an integral part of any, any industry. So if you want to train and develop the workforce of the future, the leaders of enterprises, I think you have to have a basic engineer, uh, a, a basic idea or education in understanding technology. It doesn't mean all of us have to be computer programmers, but I'd like to see, you know, women and girls who, who rise to the educational ranks be focused on this area so that they will have a broad range of opportunities and not only be employed themselves, but create enterprises and organizations where they hire people. That's one of the things that I'm most excited about in the WGDP. It's not just getting promoted in someone else's company, but it's the ability to start your own company and hire your own employees because it creates this independence. It creates the narrative of what I was saying before about it's not just a seat in the boardroom. It's about controlling your own fate, your own future. And thank you for your work in the Peace Corps. Hi, Melissa Clark, um, originally from California, but out here now. And my question is, how can we reach women who are in areas that they are not able to legally fully participate, um, whether because they can't drive themselves, they can't attend school, or for any other reason? Melissa, that's a, that's a great question. And that's one of the things that the WGDP is very much focused on. One of the important central themes in the WGDP is removing barriers to women's full participation, not just in the economy, but in society. And that means things like finding ways that they can own their own property. You know, we've had uh, conversations with the governments, whether it's a local or a regional government in a particular country, um, saying, you know, it's, it's the year is 2020. There's no reason that a woman should not be able to individually 
own property, you know, much less start her own company or drive a car. So we're having those conversations, and they have to be done on a diplomatic basis, which is, of course, what the State Department does. You know, we it's our job to to go around the world and figure out how we can cooperatively work with other people to show the benefits of women's participation in the economy. So. WGDP is making sure that that conversation is happening. And our private sector is engaged as well, because there are a lot of governments who will come to us and say, we want American investment. We want American companies here. My response is, well, if you want American companies here, you're going to have to utilize the full breadth of your population, which includes women or in just every segment of the population. That question actually sparked one for me. I'm curious if there are particular countries that are proving to be very promising partners for the U.S. in promoting women's economic empowerment. Absolutely. Well, you know, one of the partnerships I, li I highlighted with the Tijuana and San Diego Sister Cities initiative was, was a great one. I mean, the country of Mexico um, overall has been working with us in the context of USMCA to figure out how we can uh, enable women-owned enterprises to take advantage of this agreement. Because, of course, USMCA can be, it can be confusing for people to understand how to take advantage of these new trade laws. So if you have access to a market, but you don't know the nuts and bolts of how to actually get to that market, then you know what, what is the point in having it? Mm -hmm. So we've been working very closely with um, not just you know the, the Mexican government, the national government, but sometimes I think local and regional governments can be really great partners for us. Because if you're, especially if you're a women-owned SME, you may not necessarily be utilizing you know the U.S. federal government or the Canadian or the Mexican government, but your local um, regional entity may be able to provide sort of a closer hands-on training. So we try to work at every level, and our embassies are really good at that because they know the country and they know the localities as well. That's great. Yes. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm with Islamic Relief USA, and we're a federation uh, serving across the globe doing humanitarian and development work, and a lot of that is with women. Um, so I was happy to be here about your success after the training of women entrepreneurs and um, the increase in the bidding process, but it still seemed like a fairly nominal amount, and I wanted to know um, how much of a percentage that was in the overall portfolio. Thank you. That's a good question. I don't know that I have that percentage. Um, I think that the fact that they did it and they're continuing to do it, they see increases. And in fact, one of the, the things that we took away from that is it was, it was not um, a, a huge amount of time and resources. So we're encouraging other embassies to do the same thing. So not just that one embassy in South America, but if we can have embassies and consulates around the world do that, then it will be a significant, significant increase. So. I'm sorry. Uh, so I, I'm excited about the women entrepreneur thing, but I'm, I'm Kimberly Fletcher from Moms for America, and I'm all about the mompreneur. <laughs> and I, I'm not seeing a lot of, um, I don't know, help, encouragement, or even um, promotional marketing about this idea of mompreneurs and how we can take advantage of the incredible access to the internet to build these home-based businesses that can really change our lives, not just here in America, but across the world. Are you guys doing anything in that area? We'd love to, to work with you on it. It's not an area I'm, I'm familiar with, and it's not something we've focused on with, with power yet, but it sounds like a, a great area to explore. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Great. Hi, my name is Ellie Krasny. I'm with the Heritage Foundation. Um, I loved what you shared about the training program that resulted in more contracts from women-owned businesses. Um, it sounds like it was a relatively small thing with a big impact. What I'm wondering is, um, I, think, I think a lot of people in here are conservative. So when we hear about something like a certain percentage of contracts coming from women-owned businesses or wanting to reach out to like any what I'll broadly call interest group, at least for me, it kind of creates a little like, oh, are we creating some kind of like incentive structure or is it some sort of affirmative action? So how do you, as someone who's in the Trump administration and a brilliant woman, think through 
creating programs that support and enable and empower, but without creating um, onerous incentive structures or things that cause people to move away from pure economic decision making. I, I think that's that's a great question. You know, and when it comes to these training programs, they're they're never exclusive. You know, when uh, the U.S. Embassy will say, let's do some outreach to women-owned businesses, it's generally everything we do as the federal government is generally advertised so that if you are a male-owned, minority-owned, you know, whatever your uh, demographic is, you're just an entrepreneur, let's say. Let's just call you an, a small you're a small entrepreneur, whatever that may be. You know, you own a lemonade stand. Um, <laughs> any any person can come to these training sessions, and so there are you know there are SMEs owned by you. May be just you're right. You're a male entrepreneur um, who just may not be familiar with the the government contracting process. You can attend as well. It's just that I think this one embassy saw that there were. Uh, specific women-owned businesses that were not coming. And the goal was just, you know, as I mentioned, to increase the number of proposals that the embassy was getting, which is which is good for us because the freedom of choice, of course, promotes the best um, economic benefits for the embassy. You get lower costs, you get better options. You know, as we all know, choice is, is what, what makes free enterprise work. So although, you know, we're talking about women, entrepreneurs and, and certainly want to include them. It's not meant to be exclusive for, uh, exclusive of anyone, but it's a great question. Over here. Um, hi, Luis Cornelio here at the Heritage Foundation. Um, my question is, um, so what are the biggest challenges that the State Department has faced while trying to promote um, women some um, opportunities in the economy globally? Hello, I'm Susan Yoshihara, uh, President of the American Council on Women, Peace, and Security. And the Trump administration has decided going forward to align its WGDP initiative with the women's peace and security agenda. So um, I'd like to know how you see that alignment and whether there are any constructive ongoing programs uh, that we can capitalize on. Okay. Um, to answer your question, when it comes to challenges in women's economic empowerment, um, there I see more opportunities right now. I see things as opportunities rather than challenges. Um, for instance, you know, you may go to a host country government and try to have a conversation, and they don't—they're not necessarily going to view things the same way that we do. But that's why we frame. Um, it as an economic issue. You know, when I have these conversations, I'm the head of the Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs. You know, I don't approach this. I, there's a, a separate part of the State Department that, that handles the gender issues. But I frame things as an economic issue and present it to people as an opportunity. So when I'm having conversations with, whether it's with the private sector or with government counterparts or civil society, I think it's always better to find the common ground, and that's how I will view the conversations. Let's figure out how we can move this forward together. Um, so opportunities, not challenges, is how we think of things. Um, and um, on the peace and security agenda, that's a great program as well, it, and, and uh, it does align with the WGDP. For us, it goes back to you know what I said about women in the economy promoting more stable societies to the extent that you have more of the workforce uh, gainfully employed, not just gainfully employed, but having opportunities to start their own businesses, feeling some ownership in society. Um, we have learned, we know that this creates more stable societies overall, populations. It leads to better, potentially to better government decision making. So we want that theme of economic security is national security to be one that is not just here in the US, but one that hopefully governments around the world will see as well. Assistant Secretary, I really love what you said about how this is presenting greater opportunities for in the future. I think it's also um, you know, worth highlighting that the women's economic empowerment issues or women peace and security are very bipartisan. And so there's a real opportunity to build sort of networks out. So this has legs even beyond this administration. I think it's something that a lot of folks can can really get behind and be excited about. And I think that has to do not only with the 
you know, women's side of things, but because of the economic side of things. Because I think your, your programming is about providing equal access to opportunity. It doesn't always guarantee equal outcome, but it's promoting greater opportunities for, for folks. And it is about opportunities. You know, we, we don't want to design something that is equal. We, we are about equality of opportunity, not equality of outcome. We are giving everybody, and that's why I use specifically say platforms, access to resources, but, you know, we want, we want women to come up and do it on their own. This isn't something where, we're, you know, again, we're government. We don't run private <laughs> enterprise. We don't create private enterprise, but we can create an enabling environment. We can create a policy structure where women who want to take advantage of opportunities can do so. And I'm glad you mentioned the, the bipartisan aspects of it. Um, as you all may know, um, Senator Lindsey Graham and Senator Jean Shaheen have a bill that's going to institutionalize the WGDP mm. legislation going forward. So I'm hoping that this will be something that very much outlasts this administration. Yeah, that's great. Can you talk a little bit more about that? You know, I don't have the details. I, my, my staff probably has more details on the bill, <laughs> sure. and we're happy to happy to follow up with you on that. But it's just that it was highlighting the, the bipartisan nature of things. Absolutely. Senator Jean Shaheen came to the WGDP anniversary as well, so oh, it was a great That's great, <laughs> that's great to hear. Any other questions that we can take? Well, would you join me in, in thanking the Assistant Secretary? Well, I was going to give a couple minutes to Dr. Ade, who's here, and she's, she's the architect of the POWER program, just to see if she wanted to give a few words. And she's an engineer. I'm very, yes. very proud of that, a biomedical engineer. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you to Heritage for hosting us. Uh, we really appreciate that. Thank you for everyone for coming out and given the environment. Um, you truly are fearless, so thank you. Um, I just want to uh, probably end on the note of this is the POWER initiative was really designed to think of not um, reinventing the wheel, I like to say, but using the wheel that is there. Um, I find that we're in a really exciting time where not just the public sector, but the private sector is doing a lot in this area on this topic and to be able to bring the two together um, and leverage each other. So um, I guess I'm kind of giving folks some homework. <laughs> um, as you walk away from this, please reflect on how we can work together. Please reach out to us at power at state.gov um, and let us know, you know where you see the opportunities, the synergies, um, that where we can move forward on this topic, both for um, women abroad, but women domestically as well. So we, we, it's, a, it's a big community effort. So thank you again. Thank you. Peter. Well, thank you, Assistant Secretary, for coming. And thank you for everybody for coming out. Um, you know, as the Assistant Secretary mentioned, of course, with coronavirus, we know that people are wary. But clearly, this is a crowd that's excited about these issues. And we're looking forward to working with you here at Heritage, but also through the Power Initiative to make sure that we can better promote economic freedom and, and women's empowerment. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs>